You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Welcome to the Foundry. As we get going today, uh, one of the things that I think is important as we unpack this idea of what's going on in Acts 2.42, this devotion to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, this deep kind of raw, very real and genuine relationships that the early church had with themselves, with Scripture, and with and with God. And finally, we, we look into these last two, to the breaking of bread, but you know, I'm dyslexic, you know, so we're going to jump breaking of the bread, and we're going to go straight to prayer. So breaking of the bread and prayer are the last two in this series, but I want to jump to prayer today. I want to talk about that with you, and I want to wrestle with the idea of what God's calling us to in prayer. I think sometimes we think of prayer as this very um, benign thing we kind of do before we eat. Maybe we do when we hit a patch of black ice and we say a quick prayer. Um, Maybe it's one of those things we do right before we go to bed. But I think there's a more intentional reality around prayer. You know this uh, if you live in the Zealand area. Zealand schools went on lockdown this past week. At 11.37 on Tuesday morning, I get a text from my son, Josh. Can you pray for me? I don't know what for, but I'm very paranoid and anxious lately. My response, for sure I can. I'm praying for the peace of Christ to fill and guard your mind and heart today. 18 minutes later, we're in lockdown right now. I'm standing with a baseball bat outside of a closet. I'm like, okay, dude. Lay low. Don't go looking for a fight. Like, you know, my dad instincts kick in. And the strangest thing that I can tell you is that in that moment, the peace of Christ had filled my being. I wasn't worried. My initial, you know, that spark reaction was like, oh, but then I just, it was calm. And I was like, all right, keep me posted. Tell me what's going on. And we just, he and I texted back and forth a number of times. And I think to myself um, how grateful I am when my, when my boy, when he reaches out and he's like, can you pray for me? I don't know why, but I feel paranoid and anxious. Don't tell me that the spiritual world doesn't make our physical being tingle. Something was going on. You can say, well, maybe he's on, you know, the, the social media platform that, that this, you know, student had posted on. He's not. I, my son doesn't have social media. And you may say, whoa, what a great parent you are. No, I'm not. Erica and I bribed him. <laughs> we just bribed him to stay on social media. Shameless, if you want that parenting advice, it's expensive and it works. But um, the reality is he didn't know what was going on when he sent that. But God knew what was going on. God was speaking. And in prayer, we begin to have conversations with God that we scarcely understand. Today, we are going to talk in three parts of the book of Acts. Acts 10, Acts 12, and Acts 16. And we're going to look at the power, the effectiveness, and the participatory nature of prayer. It's so awesome when we see what God's doing. So I want you and I to take a minute and look across a little bit of a broader platform of Scripture in these three chapters that span actually six chapters and see what God's saying and doing as the church joins him in a conversation we call prayer. Acts 10, there's two people praying. There's two people in the middle of prayer. Peter, the apostle, and this guy named Cornelius. Now, Cornelius is, he is of the Italian regiment. He's, he's a Gentile, so he's beyond the Jewish faith, but he's a godly man. He's charitable to the poor, and he prays to God often. And God speaks to Peter, and he speaks to Cornelius. And I would encourage you to read the cha- chapter 10 of Acts. I would encourage you to get into it and chew on it because what we see in this is Peter has a vision. He has this vision and people are making lunch and he goes up on the rooftop to to just, I think, probably have some quiet time or whatever. He goes up there and it says he falls into a trance and he sees coming down from heaven a sheet with all manner of animals on it, clean and unclean, big deal for Hebrews. 
You know, they don't eat pork, which is so sad because bacon, but that's a different story. Um, but all these animals come down, and, and the Lord, the angel says to him, the Lord says to him, Peter, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter's response is like, whoa, Lord, you know that I don't and have never touched anything unclean. I don't deal with, un- I don't eat unclean things. And the Lord goes on to speak a word to him that says, don't let your rules supersede what I've done. I make things clean is what God's saying. He has made all things clean in, in terms of that dietary restriction. And Peter's like, oh, and then the Lord says, Peter, rise up and go downstairs. There's three men coming to see you. Those three men had come from the house of Cornelius. And he had, the Lord had said, find a man named um, Simon called Peter, and he will be down at this guy's house. Uh, I think his name was Simon, actually, as well. And he, will, he lives by the sea. He will be down there. Go and, and get him and bring him to you. These three men show up at this guy's house, and Peter's like, I'm the guy you're looking for. And they go to Cornelius' house. They get to Cornelius' house. Now remember them, that one is a godly apostle who has known Jesus, walked with him, and been restored and is leading the early church. Another is a Gentile completely apart from the faith. And God speaks to both of them and brings them together. He actually draws them together. And Peter, this faithful Jew, has just been told by God to change his understanding of clean and unclean because Gentiles would have been unclean, uncircumcised people. And what we see in this is God is about to do a major culture shift in the church because Peter goes to Cornelius' house. He ends up meeting with him, and it says this in verse 44. While Peter... Well, and we should know this, Uh, in verse 39, we see that Peter is actually talking to them about all that Jesus did. So he's telling them the gospel story. And it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. They are outside of of the faith. These are outsiders. And it is now, the fire has gone from the fireplace to the living room. It's jumped out of its normal context. And what we see is the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of being baptized with water. To which I'm sure Cornelius said, absolutely, but don't call me Shirley. (laughs) But um, so, but I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. But really, he says, surely no one can stand in the way of these being baptized. Peter has just had this conversation with God in prayer where he says, don't tell me, where God says, don't tell me what is clean and unclean. I make things clean. And Peter comes to the Gentiles and boom, everything changes. I would say this. Not Peter, but prayer started the gospel fire outside of the Jewish faith. Prayer started the gospel burning outside of the, um, I like the image of the fireplace would be like the Hebrews, the fireplace, and the fire jumped out of it and started consuming what was around it, the gospel fire. The message started to, to spread because of prayer. Which tells me this, and we're going to apply this one time in each chapter. It tells me this, um, we can pray for things and see them transformed. One of the teachings that uh, Erica really kind of, I think, impacted her life when she was in Mercy Ships was, um, was when you're in conflict, pray for those who you struggle with. Pray for those people who you don't get along with because even in missionary ships that care for the poor and needy in the world, there's conflict, conflicted relationships. And they said, pray for those who you struggle with because in the end, the, the spiritual truth is this, you can't hate people you pray for. Eventually, God softens your heart and you don't see them quite so critically. Pray for those that you struggle with. And what it tells me is this, prayer changes hearts prayer changes our hearts. And I think a lot of us could do with a heart transplant. 
It could, it could be a very big win for the church, for our hearts to be changed on how we view one another, how we view who God says is in and who God says is out, because we have rules as Christians quite often of, well, they're good people, but they're not really that good, right? And we get our solemn, like, Christian voice, like, they're decent people, but you know right? Prayer changes not their heart, it changes ours. And we become a welcoming presence for people to come and meet Jesus Christ and talk about him. It's an exciting idea to think that we could have our hearts changed simply by participating in prayer. The second story I want to dive into is out of Peter, is out of Peter, it's out of Acts chapter um, 12. And it's, I just love this story, I'm actually going to read it. And uh, I think you'll enjoy it. So it was about this time that King Herod, this is Acts chapter 12, 1 to 17. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death by the sword. When he saw that this met the approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he had him put in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each, which tells me this, there should be 16 people guarding this one person. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. I think that's important that we hold on to that. The night before Herod was to bring Peter to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in his cell. He struck Peter on the side and said, quick, get up. So apparently it's like, think older brother. Come on, boom. You know, he like kicked him in the side, dude, wake up. And he like boots him in the side and he says, quick, get up. And the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around around yourself and follow me. The angel tells him, like, dude, get up, get dressed. We're going to go and come with me. Peter followed him out of the prison. But he had no idea that the, what the angel was doing and that it was really happening. I love that idea. He, he had no idea what was really happening. He thought maybe he was seeing a vision. He thought he was having a weird dream. Maybe I had some bad chicken in prison. And um, they passed the first and second guards, and they came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Well, now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent an angel to rescue me from Herod's clutches and everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. So Peter's having a dark street, quiet moment alone with God going, well, that was really you. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. Remember John Mark? where many people had gathered, and they were praying. So I want you to picture with me a good Christian prayer meeting, right? And they're praying earnestly for someone they love who is in prison wrongly. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came and answered the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. She's so excited. In good Christian tradition, you're out of your mind, they say. Now remember, what are they praying for? God rescue Peter, please. Peter's at the door. Don't be an idiot. (laughs) We are praying for his rescue, right? I mean, I just love that. When she kept insisting that it was so, remember, Peter's at the door. Hey, I'm still here, right? When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, It must be his angel, you know, because God doesn't answer prayer is what they're saying. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter uh, motioned with his hand like, shh, I'm supposed to be in prison. Be quiet. And he described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. 
can I invite us to pray with a little bit of belief that God may show up? I mean, of all the fun stories in Scripture, how about that one? You know, the guys being prayed for fervently by the church, like begging God to, to free him. And when God does, they just won't believe it because that's beyond what they understood is possible. And God's like, please listen to Rhoda. <laughs> please do me a solid and just listen. She's telling you the truth. And then when she keeps insisting, like, well, it must be his angel. Because, you know, our spirits usually appear. I just can't even. They're looking for reasons not to believe. Even though they're fervently and, and, and desperately praying to God, it's one of those moments where it's like, oh, their belief doesn't match their words. And I think for you and I, this probably resonates. When we get diagnosed, when our job is in jeopardy or, some, or our finances, something's in upheaval, and we pray, but we think, you know, I'll pray about it, but I mean, seriously, you know, God helps those who help themselves. And so we're going to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps when we don't realize that in the end, God is the one who architected our circumstances quite often. He put us in this life. Now, I'm not saying he put us, he put us in circumstances um, in everything that happens. I think God allows us to make choices that break us because we have free will. But the reality is God gave us this life, and he can do with it what he chooses as long as we will obey. And God calls us to prayer to do one thing, to understand that prayer changes our circumstances. Prayer changes our circumstances. I invite you to pray with belief, to pray with belief. You know, I think the thing I love the most about um, our church is there's not a lot of pretense, you know? There's not a lot of like pomp and circumstance. There's just kind of a humble approach to things. And I was talking with a mom whose child was very sick, and she said, can we just anoint him with oil? I mean, what a beautiful confession of faith. In all the medicine, all the doctors, there's nothing wrong with that. But in the end, she was moving beyond her understanding of what science could do and saying, can we go to the one who gave us science Can we go to the one who is the architect of biology and put this little human who has a spirit before him and ask him to heal him? I love that, that God can change our circumstances. And the reality is sometimes God waits and we walk through a long, dark road and it's hard, but it doesn't mean God doesn't love us. It doesn't mean God's apart from us. He is right with us. And in prayer, we find the peace of God that walks us down this road. But we also find the power of God that can change circumstances. The power of God that can transform lives into living witnesses of the gospel. I invite you to pray and believe in what God can do. Believe maybe a little bigger than the first church did. Believe a little bigger and maybe listen for someone beating at the door. Listen for someone who God sent to do the work you most desperately need. Prayer changes our circumstances. It invites the God of the universe into what we, so limited and so finite, see as impossible. To God, it's just a circumstance. He's always been bigger than that. The next area I would like to dive into in Acts chapter 16, and this is one where we find Acts chapter 16, uh, 22 to 40 is really where it dials in, but it's a story of um, Paul and Silas, and they're in prison. They're imprisoned again. There's another disciple, apostle in prison, and what we find in this is, is Paul and Silas are, are in this situation where things seem desperate and bleak. And when things get desperate and bleak, maybe like sitting in Atlanta traffic on your way to spring break, everything gets dark, right? You're like, I don't know, put on like, you know, some dark haunting music and you just brood, right? When you get in a situation where maybe you just have this this weight about you. So here's what I love. In this story, in Acts chapter 16, we find Paul and Silas have been arrested because they've been faithfully doing the work of the gospel. It's an awesome story, but, but we're going to we're gonna have to jump past it. You can read about it in 1 to 21, but they get arrested and they're thrown in prison. And while they're in prison, it says this, 
Paul and Silas were praying, this is verse 25, and singing hymns to God. The other prisoners were listening to them. They're sitting in prison and they're praying and singing hymns to God, which I love this. Their hymns would have been the Psalms. They would have been the Psalms. It was the book of Jewish prayer and worship. They would have been singing the Psalms, the living word of God, which we know. Now we see the apostles teaching, reaching out and connecting with prayer, right? It's all interwoven. But we see them sitting in prison about midnight, singing hymns and praying. They're singing and they're praying, and it says this. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaking. At once, all the prison doors flew open. I, I, I don't know. I just think it's awesome. Like, why didn't the building fall? I don't know, because God wanted the doors open, right? So, um, but check this out. The jailer wakes up. So he was, he was on night shift, and he's sitting there like, you know, asleep. He's like, oh, oh, earthquake, earthquake. And he sees all the prison doors open. And he's like, I'm in so much trouble. I'm in so much trouble. So he pulls out his, his sword, shing, and he grabs it, and he's like, it's over for me. And he's getting ready to kill himself with his own sword because all the prisoners escaped. And Paul says to him, hang on a second, bro, wait. Don't kill yourself. We're all here. What? Yeah, I was just seeing if it was pointy. You know, he puts it back in. And here's what I love about this. The jailer called for lights. He rushed in and still trembling. Now, you've got to remember the desperation of his circumstances. He is tremoring and shaking because he almost ended himself. He's trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out, which I think is interesting because that's why he was going to kill himself. They had escaped. He brings them out and he says these words. Men, what must I do to be saved? So maybe he was listening. Maybe he fell asleep to the songs and the prayers being prayed. Maybe he heard faith that was bigger than a prison cell. Maybe he heard a confession that they were willing to go to their grave if that's what God desired, but either way, they lived a palms-up life that said, do what you want with my life, Lord. We trust you. We will sing psalms and hymns, and we will be in prayer, and we will praise you regardless of our circumstance. This dude responds, guys, what do I do to get saved? How can I have the peace you have? Because when I faced certain imprisonment for my failure, I was ready to die. I was ready to die. He wanted to be saved. And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe in him and you will be saved. And here's what's so cool. He receives the Lord. He's so filled with joy that he takes the gospel home. His entire household converts. They are all baptized because he became to believe in God. He and his whole household believed in God. Prayer does another thing. It changes lives. It changes lives. Pray for the lost. Pray for those who are far from God. I know families that have prayed for decades for, lo- for loved ones who are far from God. And I know a family that many of them have come to Christ in recent years. After a lifetime apart from God, they have come to be in the family of God. Confessing, believing Christians. Why? I believe because prayer changes lives. Prayer invites people in, whether they know it or not. And people find themselves seeing family come to the Lord after decades of discipline, prayer, and love for those who are lost. We need to be a church that prays for the lost. We need to be a church that prays above our circumstances. Our circumstances cannot dictate God's faithfulness. Yeah, I like that. Our circumstances cannot dictate God's faithfulness. And our prayers should reflect that. Our prayers should reflect that our circumstances do not dictate to God his faithfulness. He is faithful regardless of what's going on in this world. He is still God. The work for our souls in Jesus Christ has been completed. His faithfulness is seen in that. 
and his goodness is seen that regardless of circumstances, our lives can declare the gospel. Think of where Paul and Silas were when this family got saved. They were in prison, but they were doing something different than sitting there going, how could this happen to this? I thought God loved me. Why would this circumstance hit me? No, they began to pray and praise God. Prayer changes life. Lives. Prayer changes the lives of people around them. Pray for God to work miracles in and through you. You're like, dude, I, Eric, whoa, whoa, dude, hang on. Got, no, you know, I'm good with God working miracles, but not through me. That's weird. Actually, it's the only way. Every person who confesses Christ is a miracle that God found another one. And I think we miss the opportunity to be part of God's miraculous work of salvation in displaying the gospel well through prayer. Pray for the lost. Pray for that coworker who has a mouth so foul that he makes longshoremen blush. Pray for him. Pray that God will touch his heart. Pray for that family member who's far from God. Pray for that person you cannot stand who they just, it's like petting a duck backwards. Oh, it's so bad. I don't know who pets ducks, but you know what I'm saying. Like, that's just hard. Pray for them because this, prayer changes lives. Prayer grows the church. Prayer gives us God's heart for this world instead of our limited heart for this world. Here's the reality. Back to that Aslan quote. You know, when they say, well, is this big lion nice? Or is he safe? No, he's not safe, but he is good. Is prayer safe? No, it will wreck your understanding of life, but it'll give you an understanding that will fill your soul with joy and satisfaction and purpose. Purpose, purpose, purpose. Prayer gives us a better understanding of God's view of this world, and it gets us out of this limited view that we have. Man, we get one track. God's not one-tracked. God has a big view of things. And prayer connects us to that. The adventure of prayer is it turns a Christian from being a pious, like, statue in a museum to being a little bit more like Indiana Jones. You know, Indiana Jones, what he went and got ends up in a museum, but oh, the adventure of getting it, right? I love the image of Indiana Jones running from those people in Raiders of the Lost Ark where he's running and the dust is coming off him. He looks like Pigpen from the Peanuts. And he's like running. He's like, start the plane. I love that idea of the church. What if we looked more like that? A little dustier, a little bit dirtier, a little bit more well on an adventure with God because prayer changed our trajectory. We were people fully immersed in the gospel, its message, and its purpose, not because we were really good at it, but because we spent time listening to what God was saying about his desires and his heart. Let's pray. God, thank you for the adventure of prayer. Thank you for calling us out of the museum and into the field. And I pray, God, as we, the church, engage in prayer, that it wouldn't be this nice, clean experience, but it would literally transform what we believe into a full belief of you, like Peter went through, God. We would see the gospel as you see it, not as we want to see it. And you would open our hearts and minds to speak truth to those who are in sin and not help them justify it, but also in love, restore people and bless people. You, Lord Jesus Christ, are our hope and our aim. So we pray, God, speak to us, lead us, and guide us as we attend to a life of prayer, a life devoted to being in conversation with you. We pray this all in the name that has saved us, in the name that we claim and hold to our creed, our confession, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.